Good afternoon, dear doctors and pharmacists. Welcome to this webinar by Swipe RX and PNG Health. Today, we have this webinar with the theme of Closing the Gap in Iron Deficiency Anemia. Thank you for joining us today. Before we proceed to the webinar, let me go through some house rule of this webinar. All participants are muted. Please place your question in the question and answer chat box. The moderator will gladly raise them during the Q&A session. To obtain a certificate and claim your CBD points, make sure to attend the webinar for a minimum of two hours and your time will be recorded. For any question or concerns, please email us through StripeRx and they will gladly assist you. How do I get my certificate? To obtain a certificate and claim your CBD points, make sure to attend the webinar for a minimum of two hours. The time will be recorded as well. After the webinar, Swat RX will send an email to the address used for logging in to Zoom, containing a link and instruction to download your certificate. Please expect the email within seven to 10 working days after the webinar as we will be consolidating the reports. Thank you for your understanding. Today, we are gladly to able to invite Prof. Dr. Zaliha Abdullah, a senior consultant obstetrician and gynecologist from UCAN Center to be our first speaker for today's session. She is a distinguished obstetrician and gynecologist who graduated in UCAN in 1989 with further qualification from the Lawyer College of Obstetrician and Gynecologist, a master in ob and a doctorate from Newcastle University. Culinary, she is a senior consultant and professor at UCAM Medical Center, and she was served as dean at the UCAM Faculty of Medicine and director of UKM Teaching Hospital. She is deeply involved in maternal fetal medicine research, particularly in preeclampsia. Professor Zaliha chairs several important committees and has published extensively with over 130 journal articles and many conference proceedings as well. She also heads the Health Technology Innovation Lab at UKM, focusing on medical virtual reality and drone development. She is an adjunct representative of the Gobler Core Lab Pregnancy Network, centered in the Maggi Women Research Institute at the University of Pittsburgh, USA, and is also a member of the PNG Regional Advisory Board. Outside of professional life, Prof. Dr. Zaliha is a Taekwondo Black Belt and enjoys cycling with her family. Please join me in welcoming Professor Dr. Zaleha for a webinar title Paradigm Shift in Iron Deficiency Anemia Management. Prof. Zaleha, the field is yours. Thank you very much, Wonkin. Um, Assalamualaikum and a very good afternoon to all. Um, and I thank the organizers for uh, inviting me to give this talk. Uh, Right, I can see 250 participants, 252 now uh, in the crowd. Uh, thank you so much for attending. I will start the uh, uh, presentation now without delay. Um, our topic for today is paradigm shift in iron deficiency anemia uh, management. The following section will demonstrate the current prevalence of iron deficiency or iron deficiency anemia and how to identify these conditions. Women are disproportionately impacted by anemia. According to the WHO's estimates, about a third of women of reproductive age, 40% of pregnant women, and 33%, another one-third of non-pregnant women, have anemia. All right? And um, for your information, 40% uh, prevalence of iron deficiency anemia among pregnant women is actually uh, considered a public health emergency. Uh, by WHO standards. Um, our own um, prevalence of anemia can reach up to about 38% or so, and uh, much higher in certain rural areas. Uh, we have seen figures going up to more than 50%. The causes for anemia in women are generally blood loss through menstruation, fetal demands in pregnancy, and sometimes bleeding during childbirth. Now, iron deficiency is the single greatest cause of anemia globally. There were approximately 
550 million males and 650 million females with iron deficiency anemia in the year 2013, collectively accounting for approximately 62.6% of the global total of anemia cases. It is estimated that nearly one in six people of the world population are affected by iron deficiency anemia. The early signs of iron deficiency or iron deficiency anemia can easily be missed, especially in women who are not considered to be at high risk of anemia. Sometimes you're not very aware or conscious that this is actually happening to them. For example, 40% of non-pregnant adult women have low iron stores, but clinicians do not consider adult and perimenopausal women as high risk. Similarly, about 38% of women of reproductive age have heavy menstrual bleeding and who should be screened for iron deficiency and iron deficiency anemia, according to international guidelines. Therefore, a large subpopulation of women may be at high risk of ID and IDA due to having low iron stores or experiencing heavy menstrual bleeding, but remain undiagnosed. Going by hemoglobin level itself, um, according to our own study locally in um, one of the states in Malaysia, uh, we have found that as high as nearly 20% of women with normal hemoglobin levels actually have iron deficiency. IDA may manifest as non-hematological symptoms as well which could be useful in the diagnosis. Most recognized non-hematological signs of IDA are pale skin or pallor, pale conjunctiva and pale nail bed associated with some damage, uh, brittle nails, um, so to speak. However, several other symptoms are also encountered in women with IDA, such as fatigue, which is very common and quite often dismissed as normal. There can be also reduced physical endurance. Um, again, a symptom which can be normalized by a lot of people, particularly in pregnancy. Hair loss, um, which sometimes can be considered as cosmetic rather than of um, significant physical, uh, significant, um, of any physical significance. Uh, brittle nails, damage to epithelial tissues, reduced cognitive performance, restless leg syndrome, pica or you know um, abnormal appetite, and uh, behavioral disturbances. Next, we shall dwell on the diagnosis and assessment of ID and IDA. Here we present an algorithm for the diagnosis and assessment of IDA in women as determined by a Delphi consensus panel. The panel reached consensus on the need for the early detection of ID in all targeted subgroups of women, uh, meaning pregnant women, non-pregnant adult women, adolescent girls, and perimenopausal women. However, non-pregnant adult women and perimenopausal women were not deemed to be at high risk for ID and the development of IDA. Lower than normal serum ferritin was agreed upon as the most specific early marker for the diagnosis of ID in women. However, no consensus was achieved concerning the serum ferritin thresholds for the diagnosis of ID during the first trimester of pregnancy. Importantly, a positive consensus was reached on the need for serum ferritin testing in anemic women to confirm IDA. Now, a uh, slight problem with that is um, serum ferritin testing is quite pricey. If you were to consider that for the whole country, for example, there has to be a specific budget from the ministry uh, to test uh, serum ferritin in all women. What are the unmet needs in IDA management? Despite the efficacy of iron supplements, many consumers do not use these therapies to treat ID or IDA. 
A recent survey of 2,400 consumers suspected of having IDIDA in India, Indonesia and Philippines showed that less than 5% of clients who do not associate their symptoms with IDA do not use uh, less than 5% use iron supplements. Okay, The proportion of people who use iron supplements increased among those who did associate their symptoms with IDA. But even then, it is still a small number. Other therapies that were used to treat symptoms suggestive of ID and IDA were predominantly multivitamins. Several oral and intravenous iron supplements are available, including ferrous fumarate, ferrous gluconate, ferrous sulfate, iron polymaltose complex, and ferric sodium EDTA. However, a recent survey of uh, 2,400 consumers suspected of this, the same cohort that was uh, tested just now, uh, in India, Indonesia, and Philippines showed that most patients were dissatisfied with their current ID IDA treatments. In another study, about 40% of patients with IDA experienced side effects with ferrous sulfate as their oral iron supplementation. And once they have all these uh, adverse experiences, usually they are put off from taking iron supplements. Other complaints include metallic taste, poor bioavailability, and low compliance. Therefore, it is time to think if current IDA management strategies are addressing patient needs. Now, effective anemia management requires nutrients beyond iron. In patients with anemia, Iron deficiency is more likely to be associated with other multiple micronutrient deficiencies requiring multiple micronutrient or MMN supplementation. Oral MNN supplementation versus oral iron with or without folic acid is associated with a reduced risk of small for gestational age, low birth weight and stillbirth. The 2020 WHO guidance on antenatal care recommends oral mic multiple micronutrient supplementation where the benefit of switching from oral iron folic acid to MMN supplementation has been demonstrated. A Delphi consensus panel considered oral MMN supplementation to be a rational approach to treating ID and IDA in women. Several micronutrients play essential roles in erythropoiesis and iron metabolism. These include vitamins A, C, B6, and B12, as well as folic acid and riboflavin. These micronutrients play essential roles in erythropoiesis and iron mobilization or absorption and in the synthesis of hemoglobin. It is easy enough for people to take macronutrients like protein, uh, carbohydrate, and fat. It is more difficult for them to ensure they are, that they are taking micronutrients because these are usually hidden in highly in, in uh, a diet which is of high quality. And they're therefore expensive, may not be accessible to a lot of people in the lower income bracket who needs it most. Here we present an algorithm for the treatment of IDA in women and the recommended dosing of iron supplementation as determined by a Delphi consensus panel. Experts agreed that oral ferrous iron should be recommended as first-line therapy for all targeted subgroups of women with uncomplicated ID and IDA. The Delphi consensus was also reached on statements indicating oral iron dosing recommendations for the treatment of mild IDA, as well as those describing situations where intravenous iron is appropriate. Oral iron dosing recommendations for the treatment of mild to moderate IDA and the state of evidence guiding the optimal therapeutic dosing for moderate to severe ID IDA in 
adolescent girls and for severe IDA in non-pregnant adult women, adolescent girls and perimenopausal women remained controversial statements. So there's quite a bit of uh, disagreement still about how best to approach ID IDA management. Next, um, I'll discuss uh, a case study of iron in uh, pregnancy. The story of an iron mom, not iron man, yeah? Okay, iron mom um, involving um, IDA in pregnancy. Meet Amina, a 30-year-old pregnant woman. Amina shared that she is not experiencing any symptoms associated with IDA. However, a blood test revealed that Amina had IDA, as suggested by reduced blood parameters, where serum ferritin was low, and uh, despite a hemoglobin, which is not that low, although it is still within the anemia range, okay, 10.1 gram percent, just a little bit below the WHO criteria of 11 gram percent as the cutoff point. But the serum ferritin definitely was very low. Okay, Below 30 micrograms per liter is already low, but below 15 micrograms per liter suggests a, a depletion of the iron stores. So can iron requirements during pregnancy be met with dietary intake alone? The answer is very likely to be no. All right. The uh, iron intake uh, in pregnancy, uh, even um, among uh, women in uh, industrialized uh, countries, um, is actually not adequate to uh, cover the requirements, the maternal and fetal requirements during pregnancy. The RDA in pregnancy is 18 to 27 milligrams daily, which is not achievable through diet alone. Iron demands in the second trimester are needed to support the 30% expansion of red blood cell mass. Moreover, many women are unable to meet their pregnancy iron requirements, particularly if they enter pregnancy with already diminished iron stores, especially if they are multiparous, you know, they might have had excessive bleeding in the previous pregnancy, which have not actually been fully corrected when they enter the subsequent pregnancy. These are the mul multiple micronutrient supplementation studies uh, that has been conducted um, the summit study in 2007 and the Minimet uh, study in 2012. All right. The summit study used the Unimap formulation, uh, whereas the Minimet study uh, used a mixture of 15 micronutrients, but there are a lot of uh, similarities between the two lists. You can see zinc, copper, selenium, and iodine being in the list on both sides, and most of the vitamins are also uh, the same. Uh, vitamin C definitely is in the list on both sides, although on one side it's listed as ascorbic acid, the same thing. The summit study uh, was conducted as the randomized controlled trial in Lombok, Indonesia, um, involving uh, 15,000 women on each arm, um, and it uh, demonstrated uh, the benefit of um, leading to reduced early infant mortality in the treatment arm, all right, uh, with a relative risk, which is significant, um, 0 0.82 uh, overall and 0 0.75, uh, much more significant in undernourished mothers. Okay. Uh, the reduced combined fetal loss and neonatal deaths uh, was 11 to 15 percent. And the, re the multiple micronutrient supplementation also reduced low birth weight by 14 to 
33%. The Minimat trial was a randomized controlled trial in Matlab, Bangladesh. Um, a smaller number of uh, women, but still large anyhow. Uh, 4,436 pregnant women and spread over six study arms. Okay. Um, and uh, early start at nine weeks was compared to late start at 20 weeks as well. Now, in the arm with early start with multiple micronutrients, there was reduced infant mortality rate with a hazard ratio of 0 0.38, an astounding um, reduction of about uh, 62%. Okay. And uh, there was also reduced under five-year mortality rate with a hazard ratio of 0 0.34, a reduction of 66%. Okay, very impressive. So with that, I hand over to my colleague, uh, Prof. Aida, for the Sanoin clinical study. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Prof. Dr. Zaleha, for bringing us the statistic of iron deficiency anemia. As I believe that iron deficiency anemia actually is common and we need to have more awareness on it, right? It's not that so common that we need to miss it out, actually. Yeah. Because we tend to miss out the probability of diagnosing or giving the right therapy for them, for those unmet needs. Okay, so next, uh, my turn. Uh, uh, later, we will present a forum session as well at, with, at the other panels. So next, I would like to invite Dr. Aida Hani Mohamed Kalop, the consultant of the surgeon and gynecologist from UK Medical Center to continue the presentation as well. She is a distinguished specialist after graduating from University of Sheffield in 2004, and she furthered her qualification with the Royal College of Obstetrician and Gynecologists and spent more than 14 years practicing in the UK before returning to Malaysia. Currently, Dr. Aida Hani is a dedicated lecturer at UKM where she is deeply involved in multiple research projects. Her contribution extends beyond the academia. She has published extensively in extreme journals and has mentored countless students and colleagues at the same time as well. She's keen to inspire more and more medical professionals in the fields of doctors as well. Please join us in welcoming Dr. Aida to talk about the next topic of the today's presentation about the dose of iron. Is it the higher the better, the more the merrier? The floor is yours, Dr. Aida. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Wenkit, for uh, a very kind introduction. Uh, so, Assalamualaikum and very good afternoon to everyone and all participants for our webinar today. So, uh, I will talk on the topic of iron dose, uh, the more uh, the merrier. So the outline of my talk today is I will cover a little bit about prevention and treatment of IDA. Uh, majority of this has been um, presented by Professor Zaleha, uh, but I'm just going to uh, show you briefly uh, the concept of supplement and treatment. And we'll talk about uh, sign-on clinical study in details. And then I will present to you a uh, on the rationale of low iron dose. And finally, uh, I will uh, give you some takeaway messages for you to um, consider and perhaps hopefully will help uh, your current practice. Right, so we're just going to briefly talk about the prevention and treatment of iron deficiency anemia. Um, concept that I'm sure uh, majority of participants are already um, aware that there's two concepts. Number one is iron supplementation and the other one is uh, iron uh, therapy or treatment. So uh, just for you to be aware that uh, IDA is a very, very important condition that affects a whole range of um, uh, people from, you know, from infants to especially women of reproductive age. Uh, due to the importance of this condition, 
uh, WHO has come up with actually guidelines as to um, what to do in order to prevent um, you know, iron deficiency anemia in certain populations. So uh, I'm not going to go through this table, but I just want you to be aware that there are guidelines produced by WHO uh, to address uh, the prevention of IDA among children and also um, women of reproductive age. And the dosage that they suggest is actually based on the prevalence anemia uh, in the region. So um, for example, in practice, Pregnant women, I think in Malaysia, we are actually fall between 20 to 40 percent uh, prevalence of anemia. Then um, actually it's been suggested that we supplement them uh, with low dose iron, i.e. you know, 30 to 60 milligram uh, per day. Um, uh, for uh, women uh, or areas with higher prevalence, then they would probably suggest a, a higher dose. Uh, supplement or iron supplementation um, is uh, normally considered uh, low dosage, meaning you use between 30 to 60, uh, this is in adult women. And uh, the aim for that is to prevent iron deficiency anemia. This is not uh, for treatment per se. Right, so this is again WHO uh, guidelines. If you can see here, this is iron supplementation in pregnant women. The iron uh, that has been suggested is 30 to 60 milligram. This is elemental iron uh, with folic acid, uh, 400 uh, microgram. Um, together in the supplementation. Uh, our local practice, uh, meaning where we worked in uh, UKM Medical Center, we, we use a uh, supplement uh, for pregnant women that contains 30 milligram elemental iron with slightly higher folic acid uh, dose of 900 microgram. And this is uh, um, a slide that uh, is similar to Prof Zaleha uh, earlier, uh, which demonstrate for the treatment dosage, the dose is actually higher. Um, so for treatment, we consider uh, the dosage between, you know, uh, normally above um, 100 milligrams. So you can see that it's between, um, although the mention is 30, but... Uh, by right, the treatment dosage is much higher, which is um, between 100 to 120 milligram elemental iron. And this is again uh, management of IDA in pregnancy. Um, in our local practice, we use 100 milligram um, of elemental iron and WHO recommendation actually 120 milligram um, oral iron with folic acid. And as uh, demonstrated earlier, for um, effective um, absorption of iron, uh, we may we need several micronutrients that encourage the you know uh, effective absorption, uh, such L, such as uh, B twelve folic acid and also vitamin C and other micronutrients. Right, so I'm just going to talk about uh, Sanoin clinical study. Um, there are a lot of data on this study, but uh, due to uh, limited time that we have today, I'm just going to focus on uh, the main um, outcomes that uh, will be beneficial uh, to you guys. So uh, this is uh, the first non-interventional study to evaluate the efficacy and safety of, of ferrous uh, gluconate with uh, micronutrients. Right, so uh, why do they do uh, this study is to get further evidence of the uh, and clinical data of the usage of ferrous gluconate plus multivitamins and minerals because the data on ferrous gluconate um, is still lacking at the moment. Um, it's just to give an idea um, whether it's effective as a treatment of IDA. And they are also looking at the non-hematological symptoms, uh, meaning the, the effect of the treatment on the improvement of um, uh, anemic symptoms among uh, patients and also to provide evidence of the toler uh, tolerability of iron supplementation. Right, this is a quite a busy slide. Um, it is a phase four open label single arm 
prospective non-interventional study. So essentially what it is, is a study where, uh, if to put simply, is to recruit women with uh, proven iron deficiency anemia. And then what they do is they treat them with ferrous gluconate and multivitamins. Um, and then they see what happened to this, uh, you know, and, and basically they uh, just observe uh, what happened to them, i.e. in terms of their, uh, they measure the hemoglobin level, the ferritin level, and also uh, the symptoms as well as the quality of life. Um, this study do not compare um, the treatment with other types of iron uh, supplementation. So you have to be aware of that. And um, what happened is it's a prospective study. So they start patient with, they recruit the patient between the age of 15 and 55, uh, which is known to have um, mild to moderate iron deficiency anemia. And the way they know that is they check the hemoglobin to start off with. And these patients have serum ferritin less than 30. So uh, they are proven to have iron deficiency because the serum ferritin is low. And what happened was they prescribed this patient with um, one to two tablet of ferrous gluconate. So basically, uh, these patients receive up to 60 milligram elemental iron every day. And they follow this, followed uh, these patient up. And finally, um, you know, measure the hemoglobin concentration on day 14. So week uh, after two weeks, after a month, they 30 after two months and after three months. Right, so what they uh, prescribed the patient, the patient took was uh, ferrous gluconate. So one tablet contained 30 milligram iron with the following um, micronutrients, including vitamin C, uh, folic acid, B12, copper, and manganese. Um, they also include, I think sorbitol is not micronutrient, but sorbitol was added in the um, uh, preparation uh, with the aim to reduce constipation. And what they did, the researcher did, um, was they measured the hemoglobin concentration on the obviously zero, uh, two weeks, one month, three months, and nine uh, and uh, two months and three months after the starting of the uh, study. Uh, they also measure serum ferritin concentration. They also assess the IDA symptoms uh, using the visual analog scale and also measure the quality of life. So the purpose uh, for the purpose of our talk today, I'm just going to concentrate on hemoglobin and ferritin level and briefly touch on the symptoms. Right, so this is a baseline characteristic. Um, they recruited 97 uh, women in total. Um, majority of them were non-pregnant. So if you see uh, 97, um, you know, majority, uh, almost 90% non-pregnant. So the pregnant women that included in studies is only around 11. And a majority of them, uh, the mean age is 35. Uh, you can see that 50-50, um, 50, 50 has got a normal menstrual flow and another half uh, reported heavy um, to very heavy menstrual flow. Uh, just be aware for this study, they did not, uh, what they did was they asked the patient um, how heavy was, you know, uh, their menstrual flow. And this is based on uh, the patient perception or the, uh, whatever that reported by the patient. And the IDA status, uh, they all has got uh, had IDA. They all uh, were anemic. Um, only one third um, had mild anemia, and two third um, was uh, were diagnosed with uh, moderate IDA, iron deficiency anemia. Right. So um, this is the results, primary efficacy endpoints. So they look at uh, the increase in hemoglobin level. So this is the Thing that we're most interested um, in uh, in this study. Um, so what they found um, was after a couple of weeks, so after day uh, 14, this is only two weeks after um, the patient started taking the Sangobion, oh, oh sorry, the ferrous gluconate, uh, they noted that 
change in the hemoglobin level uh, from the mean of 10.1 uh, is actually increased by one gram after two weeks, um, one and a half, uh, 1.6 gram, this is from baseline, yeah? 1.6 gram after a month, and then it can reach up to 2.4 uh, gram after three months. This is um, after, you know, uh, three months from uh, the starting of the treatment. And this is the mean change. And um, and this is another uh, when they, um, another graph uh, to demonstrate that the increment is higher among those who suffer from moderate anemia. So the gray uh, line represent mild anemia. So after 14 days, there's some increment but uh, the steeper curve um, is observed among those with moderate um, anemia. So you can see the increment is much more. And if I just show you this um, table, so if you can see the mean uh, at baseline is 10.1 for everyone. And you can see for mild and moderate anemia, obviously for mild, their baseline is 11.5. And for moderate, IDA is 9.4. If you look at change from baseline, so the increment actually is more uh, pronounced or you know more significant among those with moderate anemia because these are the patients who needs iron the most so they tend to uh, display higher increment compared to those with mild anemia and you can see uh, for those who suffer from moderate anemia after 90 days uh, the increment is uh, noted to be the mean increase is 3.2 gram, whereas for the mile, it's 1.1, okay? Right, so uh, this is comparison to other studies. This is not to say that Sanoin study uh, is the best of all, but what this um, slide is uh, trying to demonstrate is these are the uh, evidence that we've got so far. Uh, just be aware, Sanoin is a uh, you know um, single arm, meaning it's just on its own. It's not uh, the treatment was not compared with other form of iron treatment. Where else by single and uh, culp, Mari culp. Um, at L, um, what they did is they use a different preparation. Uh, the study from India actually um, compared um, the treatment uh, between uh, the result between different iron preparation. Um, and you have to be aware that the dosage that being used by studies are different. So if you see for Sanoin study, the baseline hemoglobin um, by in you know, the baseline hemoglobin among the participant was 10.1, whereas if you see other study, um, it ranges between 7 to 10. And uh, the study from America, the baseline is even higher at 11.3. But what this shows is um, what kind of change that you can expect from um, different preparation uh, based on different timeline. So for Sinon study, you can expect a mean change of 1.6 gram over a month period. And over three months, you can go up to 2.4. This is the average um, increment in uh, hemoglobin. Whereas if you see other study, it can be much lower, but this is not to say that other treatment is not effective, but it's just to demonstrate that these are the type of increment uh, that you can expect from different preparation. Um, and you also need to consider that different study has got different type of population, meaning, uh, you know, even Sanoin study, they use women, some are pregnant, some are not pregnant. Um, I think Singal and Murray also use a different type of, uh, you know, um, uh, patient uh, clinical background uh, differ. Therefore, um, you cannot just compare them uh, directly. Okay, so this is secondary endpoint. Uh, they look at the increase in serum ferritin uh, during this study. 
And you can see that obviously once you treated somebody with iron therapy, then you expect the um, ferritin to increase. So the median was 7.8 um, and it increased uh, after three months, um, the treatment increased the uh, ferritin level by almost fourfold or four times. And again, um, the increment, uh, this is increment for uh, mild and also um, moderate uh, IDA. For the mild, this is serum ferritin level. The baseline, obviously, uh, for mild is uh, much higher because they have more reserve, whilst moderate is much lower. But after... Um, how do I put this? After three months, you can see that the serum ferritin is higher among mild IDA compared to moderate. And this is expected because obviously moderate um, IDA, they require more iron to build the hemoglobin and therefore uh, the reserve they have at the end will be much lesser than the mild IDA. Okay, this uh, I'm just gonna go through the side uh, adverse uh, effect experienced by the subjects. Majority of subject, which is seventy seven, reported no side effects. Uh, the remaining of them, twenty subjects report a total of 25 uh, adverse effects. However, the ones that uh, the symptoms that were suspected to be uh, related to the um, treatment uh, were only three, which are abdominal pain, hyperchloridia, and also dizziness. So um, majority of the patient, or not patients, participants who um, used the medication um, did not report any adverse effects or tolerate the medication well. Right, so um, the one that is uh, interesting is a few subjects in Sanoin had GI side effects and they reported that uh, the percentage that reported the side effects only 2%. So um, only 2% that they think um, reported side effects, GI side effects related to the medication. This is um other study uh, by Soriano and Chancelo Hidalgo uh, reported higher uh, level of uh, side effects. Again, uh, just be aware that um, these studies use different preparation. That's one and they probably have a different number of patient and patient characteristic as well. Uh, nevertheless, uh, this is a a good result to show that you know patient uh, is to demonstrate that majority of patient uh, in Sanoin study actually uh, reported much much less GI side effects. Right, so constipation. Uh, some studies reported up to twelve percent. Um, obviously in uh this study, none of the patient um you know reported uh problems with constipation. And uh, this could be attributed to the co-formulation uh, co with sorbitol, or it could also be uh, an effect of uh, low dosage of iron use uh, in the preparation, which I will explain in our subsequent slides. Right, so we're going to talk about rationale of low iron dose. So uh, things that you have to... Uh, uh, be aware by now is there are two types of iron dosage. Uh, one is a supplement uh, dosage which is between 30 to 60 and then if you want to treat IDA you go higher uh, perhaps around 100 to 120 uh, milligram elemental iron. So um, this is a, a slightly busy figures. Um, I don't know whether uh, probably I can move a little bit. Um, okay, so this is hepcidin ferroportin regulatory pathway. So um, the iron absorption or iron metabolism in uh, our bodies consists of several pathways and some of the pathways are not fully understood yet. But this pathway, hepcidin ferroportin, is one of the pathways um, that so far has been understood uh, by scientists. So uh, this is... Um, the basis of this pathway is uh, what I'm going to use to explain to you uh, the rationale of low iron dosage. So um, just to explain this, I'm just going to show you. This is hepatocyte. So you have a 
a protein called hepcidin. Hepcidin is produced by the liver, so it originates in the liver. And um, what affects the uh, production of hepcidin is if you have inflammation or if you have iron loading and things like that, it will trigger the hepcidin formation by the liver or production by the liver. Okay, now if you move to the right-hand side, uh, you have duodenal anthrocytes. So uh, iron in the uh, duodenum or in the gut will be absorbed. And then the iron that's been absorbed will then be transferred uh, transferred into the circulation. So which um, uh, channel that has been used, it's called ferroportin. So ferroportin, I'm just going to try and, I don't know, okay, I <laughs> can't show you that bit. But it's basically ferroportin is the iron channel that brings or uh, transfer the iron from the gut or uh, from the duodenum into the circulation. So what hepcidin does is it inhib inhibits and degrades ferroportin. So hepcidin sort of like stop this um, absorption into the circulation. And um, once uh, somebody take oral iron, the increment of iron level in blood will then trigger hepcidin and the hepcidin will then stop the ferroportin by inhibits and degraded it. So basically this pathway actually limits the gastrointestinal iron uptake. So hepcidin is like, uh, if you like, is um, um, a guard and it, its job is to limit or to control. It's like a bo uh, you know, border guard or something like that, that uh, controls the absorption of iron into the circulation. Therefore, the idea of this is to limit iron intake and prevent iron overload um, in uh, the body. However, um, this mechanism will affect the efficacy of oral iron. Hence, we're going to talk about the importance of the dosage of uh, oral iron as well as um, what are the recent evidence on that. Okay, so I'm just going to repeat again. So what does hepcidin do? It stops the ferroportin, which transfer iron into the circulation. So once you take iron orally, this is a control for uh, just for this pathway. There are other pathways that uh, regulates iron, but this is the main pathway that regulates iron absorption from the gut. So basically, hepcidin will stop or not stop, inhibits or reduce iron absorption based on iron level in the blood. Okay? Right. So, um, I'm going to go through one by one and try to explain it as simple as possible. Uh, there are a few studies published in the last, I would say, uh, five years that address the dosing um, and e the effect of a uh, different dosage of iron. So recent studies so show that fractional fractional iron absorption is higher at lower dose and when supplements are taken on alternate days. Okay, what it means is it's not uh, the fractional iron absorption is the percentage of iron uh, absorbed is found to be higher when you give lower dose uh, compared to higher dosage. Uh, study by Moretti found that if you give higher dosage, meaning more than 60, equals or 60, equals or more than 60 milligram, it will increase a circulating hepcidine, which we talked earlier, um, mentioned earlier, and this will decrease absorption of supplemental iron the following day by 30 to 45%. So what it means is if you give somebody iron, um, say more than 60, 100 milligram, for example, they might absorb a portion of that uh, majority of the um, 100 milligram on the first day, but they will not absorb the same amount the following day uh, and it can be reduced by up to 45%. The reason for this is because of the circulating hepcidin that we talked about earlier. Um, so um, giving higher dosage doesn't necessarily mean you get uh, it will get absorbed uh, the same amount every day. Okay. 
And this is another study by Stoffel et al. So when they give uh, 60 milligram, this, uh, they somehow split it. Number one, they give 60 for non-anemic women. These are both iron deficient women. They give 60 for non-anemic one. And they give 100 for ones with uh, iron deficiency anemia. And they found that the hepcidin again go up. But the dosage, um, but the level of hepcidin tends to subside by 48 hours. So uh, it increased after 24 hours. So the following day, the, the absorption is not as good. But the absorption goes back to normal um, the day on the third day. So this is the basis of um, the advice that, you know, uh, uh, we should consider um, higher dose uh, patient uh, who are to take higher dosage to take it on alternate days. Right. So um, interestingly as well, Stoffel et al. found that if you give iron dosage less than 40 milligrams, so it doesn't trigger an acute increase in circulating hepcidin in iron deficient subject. So what it means is if you give any um, tablet, uh, not tablet, uh, elemental iron that is less than 40. Uh, so in our case, uh, in Sinon study, each tablet contains 30 milligram iron. So theoretically, it doesn't increase the circulating hepcidin. That means that you can continue giving the lower dosage every day. Okay, without um, reducing the, the absorption of uh, the percentage that um, iron that being absorbed. Um, right. And this is study by Moretti et al. Uh, they suggest that if we provide lower dosage between 40 to 80 milligram and avoid twice daily dosing, it will maximize fractional absorption. The other thing is they found, uh, which I didn't put in here, is there is a circadian uh, rhythm uh, for hepcidine. And they found that if you give iron, give it once a day, because if you give, give twice daily dosing, again, th the second dose will not get absorbed um, that much. So you might as well just give a once daily dosing. And this is by Stoffel et al. Again, Stoffel does a lot of iron study actually. Um, the op so he, uh, he or she suggests that, uh, the author suggests that the optimal dosing, if you want to maximize the percentage of iron abs um, absorption in women with IDA or mild IDA, please consider oral dosage, uh, low um, oral dosage, which is less than 40 milligram daily. And if you are to give higher dose, you could consider uh, alternate um, days um, prescription. That means they take 60 uh, on day one and then maybe have a rest on day two and then another tablet on day three. Okay. Right. Side effects. Uh, this is something about about this slide is on side effects. Uh, side effects tend to be dose dependent. Um, a study by Raymond found that the higher dosage um, the patient take of iron, uh, the, GI, the GI side effects tend to be more common. Uh, why is this so? Number one, the iron, um, the remaining iron or iron that is not being absorbed can cause uh, inflammation of the gut mucosa. Uh, this is due to the free radicals that are being induced by the iron and also so somehow it, it lead to changes of the gut microbiome uh, and metabolism. So uh, there are more, more there are more studies on uh, gut sort of like a microbiota and how it affects you know the whole inflammation of the body and the general well being. So this is another reason um, that we should consider lower iron dosage. Okay, and studies again, uh, we we'll probably all already know this, but uh, studies has proven that if you have GI side effects with oral iron, it can reduce compliance by 30 to 70 percent. And daily uh, supplementation also has been shown to have um, almost a third more uh, increment in the uh, occurrence of GI side effect. Or uh, versus alternate day dosing. So um, sometimes if people, number one, if they have side effect, they're not going to take it. Uh, and if you consider alternate dosing, then that might improve their compliance because they have less side effects. 
Um, this is Pena Rosas did um, a systematic review and they found that pregnant women who receive intermittent uh, oral iron, that means instead of taking it daily, they take it two or three times a week, they had fewer side effects than daily supplementation. So um, higher dosage can cause side effect and also daily um, supplementation um, cause more side effect versus alternate day. Okay, so this is a case study. It's pretty simple. This is from personal experience, actually. Uh, I have a patient who is the, uh, who well, she's 32 years old, gravidated to para 1. So this, I saw her during her uh, second pregnancy. And this patient uh, was never known to have um, thalassemia or anything like that because it would have been screened in the first pregnancy. So this patient, uh, at the end of the first trimester when she went for booking, HP was 11.4. Uh, I saw her at 32 weeks actually. So two weeks prior to that, she had her hemoglobin check at, uh, and it was reduced at 10.2. So she was initially started on ferrous fumarate, uh, which contained 115 milligram elemental iron. Um, I saw her at 32 weeks. Um, I did not check the hemoglobin because I don't think it's going to um, go much higher anyway. And she was complaining that she was unable to tolerate the current treatment. Um, and therefore, I have advise her to try uh, ferrous gluconate. Um, interestingly, she was a pharmacist uh, herself uh, in one of the KKM, uh, uh, KKM hospital. And therefore, I have advised her to go and try um, ferrous gluconate that she can buy from local pharmacy, uh, which contain 30 milligram iron. So I saw her four weeks after that and her hemoglobin actually went up to 11.8. Um, and therefore, we continued the treatment. So she was quite uh, surprised actually, being pharmacist herself, um, that it went up that much. And actually, is even higher than her booking um, HB. So this demonstrate to me that, you know, she probably had some sort of iron. Uh, she might be iron deficient, but not anemic when she first booked. Um, and her hemoglobin obviously returned back to normal or even higher than uh, booking at the end of it. Okay, so key takeaways from uh, Sanoin's study. Um, so it has been shown that uh, you can get a rapid sustainable increase in HP and ferrit uh, ferritin level. Um, there are some significant improvement in physical and mental health quality of life measures actually. Um, but I did not go through that uh, because of our time. Um, but otherwise, um, if you look at the study in more details, actually they have increment or uh, improvement in the quality of life. And also it has a uh, low incident of GI side effect. Right. So this is my takeaway uh, messages for our participants today. Um, women of reproductive group are at risk of IDA. And you should be aware that iron supplement is recommended for both pregnant and non-pregnant women. Um, high dose of iron may result in increasing side effects and reduced patient compliance with no significant increment in fractional absorption. Um, however, iron therapy should be individual, individualized uh, for each um, patient. And to achieve ab optimal effect from uh, iron therapy, please consider either a uh, low daily dose, that's if less than 40 milligram, you use it daily. Or if you are to go for alternate day regimen for higher dosage, then you can give it sort of like uh, on alternate day to uh, reduce the side effect. And hopefully you can increase uh, the patient compliance. Um, thank you. Back to you, Wankit. Thank you, Dr. Aida, for your detailed dissection of such impactful studies. So high dose iron actually doesn't mean better, right? And there are many considering factors while we're choosing the iron therapy. Moving forward, I will do a sharing on the important tips while doing uh, IDA or iron counseling as well. Thank you, Doctor, for sharing the screen to me again. Hi, everyone. I'm Minkit, a registered pharmacist at Alpro Pharmacy.
many people is actually at a risk for iron deficiency anemia or iron deficiency because of their age, their gender, their unhealthy environment, family history, genetics, or even living habits. So the key groups of IDA, uh, iron deficiency anemia, including children, so inclu uh, including infant as well, as well as adolescent, women, including women of reproductive age, pregnant and postpartum women as well. At the same time, other groups like the elderly and those with other chronic medical illness like CKD, chronic kidney diseases or gastrointestinal disorder as well. Consumer may want to learn more about the iron deficiency or iron deficiency anemia. So actually, according to a recent survey, right, for 1,000 women at the age of 18 until 65, many women actually, they hope they had a better understanding of iron deficiency anemia. It is so common that many people are diagnosed or underdiagnosed, and they when they get the condition, it's too late, or I would say they need maybe more treatment for them as well. As well. And actually, more than 5 out of 5 believe that the more needs to be done to educate people about the risk factors of iron deficiency anemia. So this is a very common med, uh, health issues that actually most of the women should be addressed on it as well. Then according to a re, uh, another study as well, so the pharmacists are actually the patient first point of contact. I think the pharmacists uh, uh, with me together today, actually maybe some of them are community pharmacists. So when we are do it, uh, doing our job at the shop, right? So customer walk in that may ask you, oh, I need this iron tablet. So if, uh, they, they might be lucky if they meet you, but if they meet another, other staff, like your normal, uh, like, normal sales assistant, they may just give them just the iron tablet that, that they demand. Because like iron tablet is more like an OTC, the supplements, so they can just take wherever from the counter. And there might be insufficient counseling on the use of such supplement and increase the risk of patient getting side effects or the unable to reach their hemoglobin goal. Hence, initially in these studies, right, pharmacists can positively influence the patient on how best to manage condition like this iron deficiency anemia. Indeed, this particular study demonstrated that there are more patients receiving the clinical pharmacist intervention can reach their hemoglobin target goal with just oral iron therapy as high as 86%, contrary with those without pharmacist intervention. Uh, one of the key points over here is that maybe there are lesser side effects and in increase the patient compliance to the supplement. So how pharmacists can actually help the patient, the customer to manage the side effects. So as discussed in the previous slide, right, so there are many side effects that can occur to the customer as well. So the following strategies actually can be used to improve the tolerability of oral iron therapies. We can try to increase the dosing interval to every other day if we are giving a high dose of elevated iron, like shared by Dr. Aida just now. And so maybe some customer they complain the GI side effect, right? So they take before food but still having a very serious gastric issue. Then we might consider to make some dietary modification. Although taking iron uh, with food might reduce absorption for certain formulas, but it's still better than they have uh, under dose of the iron or they're not taking the iron tablet completely. Another method is to switch to a lower amount of elemental iron, like the fractional absorption of iron can actually increase when you may use the low dose. Another method is to switch from a tablet to a liquid formula, because micro formula we can tailor the dose uh, more conveniently than an oral tablet. We also can use a stool softener or bulk forming laxative, so that the timing bowel movement after a meal and use a formulation that has less tendency to cause constipation might be helpful for the customer as well. So when we in pharmacists intervene the treatment of this oral supplement, right? So there are many counseling points that we can do, or there are many changes or the suggestion we can give to our customer to optimize their use of uh, oral iron tablet. Next, this slide is more on the counseling guides for patients with iron deficiency anemia. And this recommendation for the counseling is actually developed by using the ASHP guidelines on pharmacist conducted patient education and counseling and idea specific management consideration from peer review literature. So actually this is just a standard guide, but we hope we can deliver the message that there are four important key points that our pharmacists should do or doctors can do when doing the iron deficiency counseling while giving oral iron tablet. The first is to establish 
The second is assess, the third educate followed by verify. First, we establish, then assess, educate the patient or customer and verify their understanding. So first, so the principal objective of this established step, right, is actually we introduce ourselves as a pharmacist or a medical professionals. Then we build a rapport between us and the customer as well. So this is very important also for the recognition of the counseling session. So we ascertain that if patient is diagnosed with this eye deficiency anemia or just a suspected to have this condition, maybe some of them, they are just going through online, they, or they go to online platform, they scroll through, see, oh, this might be helpful. So they go and buy it. Actually, they may not have the condition or they are having a more serious response, uh, the symptoms from this as well. So it's very important for us to ascertain if the patient is already properly diagnosed from this uh, eye deficiency anemia or not. Then we inform the expected length of this session, maybe a five to 10 minute session with this customer. So we establish the relationship on this part. Next, we assess. So for patient with iron deficiency or confirmed iron deficiency anemia, so first we assess a patient knowledge about their condition. So do they know that they have this IDA? And we inquire about their attitude to the condition. Do you think that this is a very serious condition? Or do you think that this uh, is a like life threatening? or depends on their HP level as well, then we see, assess their knowledge and also their attitude. So they actually, from patient point of view, when we do this kind of counseling, customer or patient are more ma motivated to accept the medication and also be compliant to the medicine treatment as well. So we also can ask the patient if any medication was prescribed previously or they have, or they have been trying or any other iron tablet formula. And we try to determine if they've made any improvement to their diet. For everyone understanding that many diets from our daily intake, right, they actually contain iron and or some food or some drinks actually impact the absorption of the iron at the same time. So from here, we need to ask the customer whether they make any improvement or they're taking the medication at the correct timing, correct, uh, or they mix with other kind of medication that will reduce the efficacy of the medication. So we need to have this access. We access the patient take a proper history. Next, for patients with suspected ID, I mean we are not sure, so the patients come in, they are looking for iron tablet. So we need to assess if a patient is a high risk or not. So as mentioned in the previous slide, so this group of med patients essentially have at a higher risk of iron deficiency anemia, mainly infant, children, adolescent, women of reproductive age, pregnancy or postpartum or even elderly as well. So from here, we can determine whether they have higher risk then what should we do next? We tell the customer that what the factors that possibly contribute to the iron deficiency. Actually, health literacy is very important because when patients have more higher health literacy, they'll improve their compliance with the medication. So if customer is a vegetarian, a vegetarian customer, so they may have a lower intake of iron from diet as well. And we check if they have any celiac disease because this will decrease the absorption of iron, any increased demand like mentioned previously. Is the patient having any blood loss like heavy menses or gastrointestinal bleeding previously? To check for acute illness like H. pylori infection or they are actually suffering from chronic diseases such as CKD, chronic kidney diseases. So we explain to the customer that what are the possible factors that contribute to the iron deficiency. So most of them, they will, oh, okay, so yeah, yeah, they agree with the reason of they causing them to have this iron deficiency. So they will take charge of their own health to take the iron supplement. So next, what are the drugs affecting the iron absorption? The very common example will be level tyroxine. So the simultaneous injection of iron and level tyroxine at the same time can actually reduce the, uh, the level tyroxine efficacy in some of the patient. So the suggestion is to get problems in between level tyroxine and also the iron supplement. The second one is the proton prime inhibitor. As you all know, the iron is better absorbed in the, as, uh, in the reduced form, Fe2+. So if let's say patient is taking PPI for a long period of time and they have a lower iron stores, they may have suboptimal responses to iron supplementation. However, in a patient with normal iron store taking PPI for long term, up to 10 years might not be associated with iron depletion. Next, after we assess the patient whether they are at high risk, then we help the patient to record any clinical signs and symptoms of iron deficiency anemia for us to determine whether the the medication of the supplement is working for the customer. Actually, I think many pharmacies, we have a recording system as well. Then we can record the science system for the patient. 
So the signs and symptoms associated with iron deficiency anemia um, can be wild and can be non-specific because they are very similar symptoms with the other issue as well. And actually, it depends on the severity of anemia, age, comorbidities, chronicity, and the speed of onset of such symptoms. So signs and symptoms can be highly suggestive of ID or IDA at the same time, can be split into two types that we can see, the signs that patient can see or the symptoms that patient can feel. The common that patient's sign can, can see is a paleness, brittle nails, crack and ulcer in the mouth, or hair loss. I think it's very sensitive for women to mention that they have more hair loss, like they can spine in their bathroom or the... Yeah. Then the symptoms that the customer can feel are fatigue, headache, shortness of breath, difficulty concentrating, dizziness, coldness in hands and feet, weakness, insomnia, and susceptibility to infections. I think the most prominent symptom that most customers will feel is the uh, tiredness, fatigue, very difficult to focus. Next. We try to utilize the lab test to confirm the diagnosis of ID or IDA. Some pharmacies actually, they, are, they do provide the test on the hemoglobin level, while some labs actually, they can check more details like the uh, full complete iron study. So the clinical signs and symptoms actually are not sufficient to diagnose ID and ID or IDA, so a blood test might be actually recommended or required. So there are three important uh, blood parameters that we can look at, for example, like hemoglobin, ferritin and transferring saturation. So hemoglobin, I think everyone is well known on this. It is a protein that regular cell that carries oxygen. So once your hemoglobin is low, then it's very high chance to get the iron deficiency anemia. So what is actually ferritin? So ferritin actually is a protein in the plasma which reflects the body iron stores under normal circumstances. But ferritin's level is actually very sensitive. So once you have like inflammation or you have any liver injury, so the input, uh, the ferritin level can go haywire and very difficult to interpret. If you're able to exclude the inflammation level from the customer, so the ferritin level is actually convenient to reflect the iron stores. So uh, practically, usually we see a uh, low ferritin level in patients with a very lower amount of the iron deficiency. So the next one, we want to transfer in saturation TSAT. So transferrin is a protein that's responsible for transporting iron. So this TSAT is a measure the proportion of iron that's bound to transferrin and iron transport protein using the measurement of serum iron and iron total iron binding capacity. So just to make this a uh, long story short, right? So let's for example you have let's say you have ten uh you have ten cars. So on these ten cars, you want to check how many cars are actually sit sitting with the passenger. So the passenger is something we call as iron actually. So from there we can check how much uh, iron was actually utilized. Let's say if let's have 10 cars but you only have two passengers in between, so the transferrin level might be lower actually. So this is actually uh it's a, might be a characteristic of the iron deficiency anemia, but mainly we're still looking at the hemoglobin level. So anemia is actually considered a silent disease. Huh? Because that very mild symptom, or like just shared by Prof. Zaleha and Dr. Aida just now, that anemia is many customers, many patients, they, don't, they are underdiagnosed. They don't know that they have this issue. Because many of them actually no symptom, no sign. And according to a few studies, actually almost 40% of people with ID or IDA, but no sign and symptom at all. So, which makes uh, diagnosing actually quite challenging. Next, we educate the importance of proper diet and oral supplementation of iron deficiency anemia. Okay, so according to the World Health Organization, right, a poor diet is the primary pathway by which nutritional anemia will develop. Hence, it's very, very highly recommended that customers should make dietary changes to help to manage the iron deficiency better. It might not help totally, but at least there are some changes to the diet, then the customer could improve from both the iron supplement and also from the diet at the same time. But then we can tell the customer, so these are the recommended dietary allowance from the irons. So let's say um, a woman at reproductive age, age right? So basically per day, they need 18 mg of iron. So you can check from there and just ask, randomly ask the customer, what have you been taking uh, usually? As the, any iron in the diet? And if they're pregnancy, they actually need a much more higher iron content as well, 27 mg. 
So it might sound low if you're taking iron tablet, but if customer is underdiagnosed and they're not taking all this, then the high chance of anemic issue will happen in this group of customer. There are vegetables rich in iron. Okay, so if anyone is interested, you all can go to this website, right? It's called Food Standards Australian New Zealand Online Database. You can search for these types of iron. Uh, this is such type of food that's high in iron. For example, this slide, yeah, we are showing the vegetables in vegetables form. Vegetables, iron in vegetables are actually non-heme iron and they are inorganic. So the absorption is actually lower compared to the heme iron, which is the organic form. Okay, so some of the examples over here is uh, fenugreek seed. Uh, uncooked serum, dark chocolate without any added sugar, chia, dry chia seed, all these are of a higher value of uh, the magnesium, uh, so is the iron in the content. So the next one are the organic, or we call it heme iron, which is usually found in meat. For example, like grilled lamb liver, they contain 11 mg in 100 gram of such uh, food. Followed by raw chicken liver, sardine, uh, yeah, Australian sardine, mutton, all these, they actually have higher value of iron in them. Next, we try to educate the custom, uh, the importance of the diet, right? After we tell them the dietary changes, then we can tell them that actually overall iron supplementation is an option for ID or IDA. So what are the options that is commonly available over here? Then we do a very simple acronym called DRUG, D-R-U-G. So in my following slide, I will explain the detailed acronym on this D-R-U-G to help us to help the customer to give them some vital information of oral iron supplements. For this D, D stands for dosage. So it's referred to the prescribing information of oral iron therapies. And there are many different types of iron supplements. So this iron type of iron supplements that contain different types of the elemented iron, highest by ferrous fumarate 33% and lowest by ferrous gluconate 12%. But from the previous talk, we are aware and we know that the higher the elemented iron doesn't mean the iron is better. It only means that the combat of iron is more concentrated in certain compound. But it doesn't mean that the absorption is better or it's more helpful for the customer. So there are different formulations for uh, these iron products. And when to take iron, so you should take it in the morning, afternoon, or night. And so, although Prof, uh, Dr. Aida has mentioned it just now uh, on the hepcidine, but I would like to mention this procedure again on the hepcidine because it's a very important pathway that we need to explain to the customer. So hepcidine for a protein regulatory pathway are also mentioned by Dr. Aida just now. So when we know that once we take the iron, so the iron will be absorbed, okay? is absorbed by a something called ferroprotein. Okay, you need ferroprotein to help you to transport the iron. However, this bad guy, hepcidin, actually will inhibit and degrade the ferroprotein. So let's say you go to a ticket, you go into the body, let's say a ticket station. Okay, you need a ticket. Okay, you need a ticket, which is called the ferroprotein to go inside a place. Okay, but there's a bad guy called hepcidin will steal your ticket. If you don't have a ticket, then you cannot go in. So that's how this uh, explanation of the diagram. The, the hepcidin actually upregulated following the oral iron intake at the same time. So let's say you are taking more iron, so there will be more bad guy to steal your iron. Okay, so that's the concept of it's not really the higher the iron, the better is it. Okay, so this uh, fractional iron absorption is a very important new concept that's as also mentioned by Dr. Aida. They will understand this thing, not to say the higher the iron, the better is it. So customer, I think very common, they will ask you this brand and that brand or this content with that content, what are the differences between the iron? We don't really actually look at the price, but as a pharmacist or doctor, then we tell the customer the difference in the formula and the way that we act or the body react to them because of the dose of the iron. The dosage also, um, like mentioned just now, high levels actually inhibit duodenal iron absorption and release of iron from the macrophages as well. And the production of hepcidin increased by inflammation. So if you are having inflammation, not uh, the hepcidin will be affected as well. So we can see that actually some patients with chronic diseases like CKD, their iron store is actually very low because they have their body has been inflamed. So they have high uh, the hepcidin level. So you cause the uh, absorption of iron to be lower. So that's why it's a very uh, vicious cycle that very difficult for customers with chronic disease 
to get sufficient iron. And if I found that one of the studies actually that shows that the hepcidin level in a general population is actually lower in the morning and increase in the afternoon. So we might be able to counsel the patient to take the iron tablet in the morning might be a better option. So iron should be taken BB or EOD. I also emphasize from just now as I think this is a very, very key important message that to be delivered in both of these sessions. So iron should in some practice, right? So elemental iron as high as 100 to 200 mg per day across two to three divided doses were recommended because they want to boost up the higher uh, iron level. And in women who are iron deficient or non anemic elemental iron doses more than 60 mg raise the concentration of hepcidin for 24 hours. So the blocking assumption of subsequent doses. So that's why if you're taking 60 mg of elemental iron, it's better to have EOD dosing to maximize the absorption. And some studies also found that 33% more iron was absorbed over the doses when given alternate daily compared with daily doses. So that's uh, the EOD dosing. And the dividing doses like taking BD actually worsened a fractional absorption. And even you take more, you get less. Result, D-R-U-G. So the R stands for the result. Result, we educate the patient that the treatment may take up to six months to see the improvement in clinical blood parameters. There are some of the uh, recommendations last time. And we inform the consequences of the non-adherence. So as mentioned also by doctor just now, actually HB not really can be reflected after three months, like so long, you can see the effect. I think in old practice, we tell the customer, you take the iron supplement for three months, then you see the effect, then we check the HB again. So it might not, it is correct, but it might not reflect the real situation that more studies has been conducted. So in this study, right? So actually the earliest increase can be seen of one gram per deciliter of hemoglobin can be seen as early as two weeks. And we, of course, we ask the customer to continue the medication, the supplement for about three months to see the maximum effect from this iron supplementation. ERUG, U stands for underlying issues refer to the information of oral iron therapy as well but it's more to other information that accept the dosing so we inform the customer that oral iron therapies are associated with gi discomfort and also poor taste because some customer they thought that we give a spoiled product i ever encountered before that their the customer come back and ask uh, why why the the drug taste so weird is a metallic taste so i think it's very important for us the pharmacist to counsel that the iron supplement actually they may have a metallic taste okay it's very common actually it's not the side effect but it's a come along issue with the iron therapy so the iron oral iron therapies are some of them may be also associated with gi discomfort some people get uh, most people i would say they will get constipation so we can uh, choose another formula with them with a better gi profile and we need to tell the customer the efficacy of oral iron therapies are influenced by diet. Diet actually plays a very big role, as also mentioned by World Health Organization. And so what will decrease iron absorption? So basically, there are three main things that are very common we see every day, every movement. Calcium, phytates, and polyphenols. So what is calcium? So calcium actually inhibit heme and non-heme iron means from vegetable sources and also from meat sources at the point of initial uptake into enterocyte. And we try to ask the customer to avoid antacid because calcium carbonate in the antacid, right? Also inhibit the iron absorption and also neutralize the gastric acid. So if patients are already having a gastric issue and they are planning to take the antacid, they should take the iron supplement later, about two hours later. Phytates are found in plant-based diet that demonstrate a dose-dependent effect on iron absorption. Phytates usually decrease the non-heme iron absorption, which is from the vegetable sources. For polyphenols, polyphenols are commonly found in black and herbal tea, coffee, wine, legumes, and cereals. And our all-time favorite thing over here, I think most of it, maybe most of it drink this every day, tea and coffee. Tea and coffee actually contain high level of polyphenol and phytic acids, which should inhibit the non-heme iron absorption. So if the customer is taking the iron tablet, it's a compulsory for them to get it with any tea or coffee intake. Tea contains high amount of tannins and oxalates, which also inhibit the iron absorption. While coffee consumption was found to reduce the ferritin level as well in men and post 
menopausal woman. So when counsel and customer, we ask them the diet, like just now we assess, right? So what are the diet changes? Are they taking coffee every morning, then taking an iron tablet at the same time? Or they are taking some 40, iron 45 food or uh, vegetables? Are they drinking coffee at the same time? If they are doing so, actually they might wasted the very good ingredient iron from the uh, vegetables or the food. Or the, or, or the food. So this is a very important counseling point that we can explain to the customer so that they know all oh, need to get like this. And general information is the DRUG, the last part of G. So we educate that other micronutrients, like also mentioned by the previous speakers, like folic acid, vitamin C, vitamin B12, vitamin B6, copper and manganese are very important for overall blood health. And we tell the customer how to store the medication at room temperature, Use the, how do you use the medication, taking it morning, one capsule, urine foam, and whom to call if they have any questions. And this, this simple diagram is an explanation on why, uh, with the, how vitamin C can help. I think some formulas, iron formula that mix vitamin C together, or some practice that give iron tablet and vitamin C at the same time. So dietary intake, right? For this, uh, let's say we take, a, we take a vegetables, so we get a dietary iron. So the iron inside the vegetables are Fe3+, plus, okay? So it will be reduced by Fe2+, plus, plus through the transported channel, and also uh, inside our duodenal enterocyte. Then it will be absorbed to our blood. So this vitamin C, as an antioxidant, it prevents the iron 2+, plus to become iron 3+. plus. Because when you are at the iron 3 plus form, it's very difficult to be absorbed. Like you're blocking a door. If you are Fe3 plus, you cannot go in the door. You must be Fe2 plus formulation to be go through the door easily. Okay. So that's how this and uh vitamin C can help because they will anti prevent the iron from oxidized. They will keep them preferably in the reduced form to ease in the absorption. Next one, the general information are on the copper. Copper actually involved in the conversion of inorganic iron into hemoglobin. They help the uh, iron to go into the hemoglobin to make you sit on your car easily. Okay, but it does, doesn't affect the absorption of the iron. For the folic acid, folic acid involved in the formation of heme and the deficiency of such folic acid actually affect the RB's uh, regular cell maturation. So we can see some, the lab report like the flu blood test, we can see some parameters are not in range, because, because like indicating the RBC is bigger, like not larger than normal. So if without folic acid, then we call and uh, we have another category of the anemia at the same time. So all these are important supplements or micronutrients for the iron therapy as well. Next one is vitamin B12. What I mean B12 is whiter in the remetallization of the amino acid, homocysteine to methionine, which aids in the synthesis of SAME. So what is, what is this SAME? SAME is a key metal donor involved in the DNA synthesis and red blood cell maturation. So if, if you do not have enough vitamin B12, your blood cell is very difficult to mature as well. The next one is sorbitol. Sorbitol can link with iron to form a lower molecular weight complex that is actually smaller than water, which can be absorbed better. Sorbitol can improve the iron absorption and also reduce the constipation issue at the same time. As shared by Dr. Aida just now, that the formulation containing sorbitol has lower risk of constipation. So we also have this uh, ready-made formula that we tell customer on how to take the supplement or the indicated medications. So we utilize this drug acronym DRUG to educate the patient on the important consideration of these oral iron therapies. So this is a summary slide that I have mentioned to you all just now. So we do the education over here. Okay, so we, after the assessing, then we do education. After we do the drug acronym for the customer, right? So we reiterate to the customer that dietary diversification is really important, crucial to prevent ID or to reduce the symptom of ID to make sure that yeah, medication are working in a better way. The WHO recommendation is to increase the consumption, consumption of iron-rich food 
containing the vitamin AA or the carotenoid rich food at the same time. So actually some of the uh, supplements or some of the foods, right, they're actually fortified with iron. So they are more recommended for customers to take them for those iron deficient. Add fruits or vegetables that's rich in citric acid or ascorbic acid like oranges to increase the absorption of non-heme iron. Like I've mentioned just now, vitamin C can help the absorption of iron. Try to avoid iron absorption inhibitors with iron-rich meals. So like some of the product, like milk product, should not taken together with iron because it will inhibit the iron absorption. We try to verify, uh, after we verify, we check the condition, we check their medication, we do some lifestyle changes for them, right? So we do some verification with them. So the last part of this verify, meaning that we check with them their understanding. Because if we realize that the customer doesn't understand what you have said, there's uh, no point giving a long counseling session. So from time to time, we assess, we give information, we verify them. So we verify their understanding on this idea idea to see and how to manage their medication, their supplements, and what are lifestyle changes that they can do. Because we don't want to give something that is impossible for them to do. Like, let's say, for example, they have been drinking coffee every day in the morning. It's a habit for 10 years. Then we ask them to stop. It's very unlikely to be able to do that. And the, But we, what we can do is that we can ask the customer to get the iron supplement from the, from the coffee. For example, they can take in the afternoon or they can take before sleep. At least they take the supplement correctly, can improve or increase the absorption of the iron. We ask the patient to describe how they use their medication and identify their effects. So let's say uh, you can tell, you ask them once to do counseling, then we, you ask them again, do you remember what I just said? How to take these iron supplements? So if you have constipation, what should you do? Do they have weird taste or do they have metallic taste? So see the understanding. So we ask the customer how they describe their use of the medication. Then we observe their medica patient medication use capability and attitude towards this management. Some of them, they say, okay, I take three months, then I will check, come and check for you again. So I think the responses are very important and we should take the role to verify them. So with this summary of the four steps towards the counseling patient with ID or IDA, First, we should establish, we establish a good relationship, good rapport with the customer. Second, we assess either they are already confirmed with any deficiency anemia or they are just suspected. If suspected, then probably we can do a blood test to verify the deficiency level and to do appropriate counseling and recommendation later on on the education part. We are not only able to educate on the oral iron supplementation. We don't just give, okay, now iron tablet, you can buy and go home. We do more than that. We help them to manage the expectation. Because many customers, they wouldn't know, how long should I take this? Or take one month, stop one month, is it okay or what? So we need to give them some expectation. You take this for how long? Then you come and check again. So every important, we can do follow up at the same time. So the oral iron supplement are crucial because we don't only dispense the product. We let them know how the products work for them. It's actually improve their compliance, improve their understanding on the medication, and they know that they should take it. Besides on the iron supplementation, they also can consider on the nutrition part. So there are many iron-rich food in the market, then they can choose to take more of it at certain timing to improve the iron store in their body. Lastly, we verify the condition. So we verify how much understanding of the customer and eventually we can do some follow-ups later on. So we establish, assess, educate and do verification. Thank you. That's all for the presentation from my part. Thank you for joining us. And next, we will have a panel discussion with Dr. Aida and also Prof. Dr. Zaleha. Hi, Doctor. Hi. Hi. Okay, I think still too fresh, right? <laughs> okay, so basically, uh, we'll go through the uh, question and answer. I think there are many, many questions over there, and I'm very thankful for uh, Prof. Zaleha. You have been so hardworking, so fast in answering the concern by our uh, the chat in the chat box. So should we go through the answered question one more time in case some of the, uh, the participants, they miss out? 
Yeah, sure. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, uh, any doctor interest to answer, then you can just take the take the questions. So the first one, I think I'm already, I will, I will just briefly go to those who have answered already. So to provide extra information if necessary. So a uh, participant asked that the maximum dose of cosmophore is 20 mg per kg. So if patient is 90 kilo or more than that, actually can we give like up to 1000 mg or 2000 mg? I think uh, Prof. Daleha you in comment on that, right? Do you want to give any extra information? Um, sorry, which which question is this? Uh, uh, uh in the, an, oh, in, in uh, the yeah, ans yeah. Uh, answer one. The next dose of cosmophore. Dose of cosmophore, yeah. Yes. Yep. Um, certainly you should not exceed the uh, maximum dosage. Uh, what you should do is if the your calculation shows that the uh, requirement exceeds the maximum dosage of 20 milligrams per kilogram, you should only give a maximum of 20 milligram per kilogram for a start at one sitting. And then the give a gap of at least seven days before you give the next uh, dosage to uh, finish off the remainder of the dosage, the requirement. So that's okay. the answer. Yeah. Yeah. So I uh the, I think the second question is quite direct on the cost morpher, either single dose or divided. So I think as long as they exceed the maximum dose, right, then they should be divided by at least one week. Yep, correct. Okay. Let me see the question. Ah, I think this is very interesting. The common dosing of folic acid uh, in a um, a community setting in the market, right? Some of them five mg, some of them zero point. 4 mg is 400 mcg so customer also confused why the big gap the difference is so big right so yeah your comment on this right okay um this is an, an age-old story you know our uh, folic acid tablet in kkm has always been five milligrams yes. you know uh, yet the uh, recommended maximum dose is actually one milligram per day uh Beyond that, um, it is feared that, you know, the patient might uh, suffer from a short-term side effects, especially GIT symptoms. And in the long term, there is some concerns uh, of late that uh, there may be some development of uh, malignancy. All right. Uh, but uh, what I believe is that the dose should actually be individualized because the requirement of the individual uh, person, especially mothers in pregnancy, is not exactly the same. Uh, pregnant women with uh, with high risk of neurotube defect, for example, those with previous history of neurotube defect, those who are diabetics and all that, uh, obese women, for example, uh, you should give at least 0 0.8 milligram per day. So one milligram is okay. Lah, all right. And uh, those with thalassemia, all right, and on anti-epileptic treatment, for example, may need higher doses. Okay, uh, there's a paper with Prof. Arukumaran from the uh, Royal College of ONG that says that um, um, you should give these uh, patients, uh, the last two that, that I um, quoted, thalassemia patients, anti-epileptic, uh, those with that, on anti-epileptic treatment, which is an anti-metabolite, um, a higher dose of uh, folic acid. He even recommended uh, 5 milligram BD in one of his papers, but that was many years ago. Okay. Uh, and uh, the opinion that the um, dose should not be that high has just come uh, much more recently. I see. Okay, thank you Prof, for, your for your answer and sharing on this. So maybe we can start going back to the questions because I think there are many, many questions over there. It's very interesting as well. So, uh, okay. so this question is on what if the patient has normal or baseline HB, but the ferritin is low. So what will be your recommendation or advice? And what could be the cause of low ferritin level, but normal or baseline HB level? Okay. Very interesting. Um, as I mentioned in my lecture just now, uh, very interestingly, we found in a study, we conducted the study in Kinta Valley, actually in Perak. All right. And um, uh, we looked at the patient's hemoglobin as well as serum ferritin. And we found that as high as 19.1% of patients with normal hemoglobin level in pregnancy actually had low serum ferritin. In fact, we used the low serum ferritin uh, benchmark as less than 12 nanogram per oh, pill, which is very, okay. very low. Very low. Yeah, at that time, yeah, this was in 2008, long time ago, before the more recent uh, benchmark of 15, 30 and all that came through. All right. So uh, it was much more undecided at that time what, what is considered as low uh, serum ferritin. So uh, in other words, you can have somebody with uh, depleted iron stores, 
but still maintain a normal hemoglobin level. Mm. So I think it's still very possible, but the cause is re- not really sure yet. Well, it is iron deficiency. Just mm-hmm. that iron deficiency is uh, 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 quite uh, unique in the sense that you only get its manifestation, particularly in terms of the hemoglobin level, when it is really, really very badly depleted. Studies have shown that, yeah. Almost like zero iron stores, then only you get the hemoglobin level to be low. <laughs> okay, thank you, doctor. So the next question, maybe directed to Dr. Aida. So, uh, doctor, what's your recommendation? Like, are we able to prescribe the iron supplement for prevention purposes? Okay, um, I did mention about the um, the WHO recommendation, isn't it? So as a general rule, um, women are normally, women are the group of reproductive age are the group that tends to need iron supplementation because obviously they have menstruation every month. So they, they lose blood theoretically every month. Uh, major, some women might... Uh, have good iron intake and they have normal hemoglobin level. But um, as even WHO suggests that, you know, if, if you have a group of menstruating women, those are the ones that you might want to consider uh, supplementing them. Uh, pregnant women, obviously, you need to supplement them because they, uh, because of the pregnancy uh, requirement, you know, um, for fetus and also mothers. Um, but... For menstruating women, I think it's worth number one uh, speaking to them that you know if if they have any symptoms suggestive of um, IDA, then I would certainly advise at least uh, get it checked the HP level. Um, but if they don't have any, then even WHO suggests that you know you can take it uh, a low dosage, maybe not every day throughout the year. Um, I think they give uh, three consecutive months in a year. So you mean that let's say in the places where they don't provide HP tests? Yes. So they are still then if they want take to three. take it, yeah, because you just give a low dose anyway, about 30. Uh, they yeah. can go in a year, maybe they can take up to three months. Uh, but nevertheless, it's worth um, speaking to them. You see whether they think that the period is heavy or if they have any questions um, or concern, then uh, maybe worth getting their HP check at least once. You know, if you never, yeah, if they never had it done before, um, at least you know a screening test would be, um, I think, beneficial. Okay. So the next question is on the iron intake. So I think we do see a lot of pregnant mothers that uh, has low HB level initially. So once the HB level returns to normal, I think we shall continue it until the the post delivery of baby, right? Uh, okay, can I answer that? Yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Once once it returned back to normal, do you remember the the requirement, the supplement? The women still need the supplement in pregnancy, which is between thirty to sixty milligram uh, per day uh, throughout pregnancy. So if it's gone back to even normal level, she still need that, you know, the supplemental dose. So I would say continue it. Um, as a general rule, um, sometimes people check ferritin. Um, uh, ferritin level, uh, once it reach 100, then it's um, sufficient, um, you know, sufficient level. But majority pregnant women during um, pregnancy, I don't think with uh, 30 or 60 milligram you would reach um, hundred <laughs> ferritin <laughs> during the pregnancy, but you can carry yeah. on postpartum as well. Yeah. yeah, I can carry on. Okay, so okay, and the next question is on the hemoglobin level. Is there a maximum level of hemoglobin, or is there any risk of getting too high of HB? Let's say for a customer, they are already taking a high dose of iron, but they are like not following up with the doctors. So in a pharmacy setting, so what the suggestion in this group of patient that maybe they are already Maybe it's past reading, maybe let's say 16 or 17 for a man. It's called normal, right? But they still continue the iron therapy. Will that be like over or is there any risk, health risk associated with a higher level of hemoglobin? Dr. Um, There are some conditions, but that's, that's a different uh, hematological condition where the, the HP is a little bit too high. But you have to check why... Um, the patient is especially like men. Why are they continuing taking iron? You know, um, throughout 
um, a long period of time because normally the ones that at risk is women. Yeah. Um, but if they are HB, um, I assume you have access to checking hemoglobin at the pharmacy. Um, I would say that mm -hmm. if if the levels too high, then they need to be seen by a doctor because obviously when you have polycythemia or very high level, that they're predisposed to condition like uh, deep vein thrombosis and things like that or some clotting uh, problem as a general rule. Um, so if you come across uh, some body with a very high HP level uh, that is not within normal range, then maybe advise them to see a doctor for that. Yeah, need uh, some further investigation on that issue, right? Yeah, unless when... Prof Zaliha has got any, <laughs> any info <laughs> she wants to. Well, um, I saw that question about um, uh, excessively high hemoglobin, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, that usually doesn't uh, occur simply because, you know, you're taking too much iron or anything like that. But uh, I have the same opinion with Ida. I don't see um, the reason why anybody would want to take iron if their hemoglobin is good and their serum ferritin is already good. Uh, for one thing, iron, um, uh, the, the ferrous iron ion is actually, the cation, is actually um, uh, a source of uh, oxidative stress as well. Like, for example, in pregnancy, if you already have enough iron, um, you should not be overtaking, um, overdosing yourself with uh, iron because uh, it, it uh, uh, poses an oxidative stress to yourself. Oxidative stress are things which can even cause like preeclampsia in pregnancy, that kind of thing. So it's not good. But that question about uh, excessively high hemoglobin, usually excessively high hemoglobin is caused by other things. For example, polycythemia rubra vera, you know, or somebody with a um, hole in the heart with cyanotic heart disease, for example, uh, who develop uh, polycythemia in response to the chronic hypoxia that uh, he or she is suffering from. So these are highly pathological conditions. Uh, polycythemia rubra, rubra vera, for example, is a hematological condition that requires specific treatment by a hematologist. So it is quite outside the uh, discussion about iron supplementation. Yeah, so basically, if you are general population, if you take like low dose iron, actually they should not increase over the level, right? Yes, because our body has got its own, um, uh, what do you call this, check and balance mechanism. If you already have enough iron, it will not really um, uh, absorb very much of the iron that you're taking. In fact, um, it may even cause a lot more gastrointestinal side effects because, uh, you know, uh, it is not uh, absorbed into the body and yet it travels through your GI tract and might be causing you a lot of uh, constipation and things like that for no particular good reason. Understood. So, okay, this part is on the side effects part, right? So in your usually clinical practice, right? So if the patient is already experiencing some GI side effect, it's not mentioned here, maybe I assume it's a constipation. Does reducing the dose will help to reduce the side effect? Or what would be your suggestion or you prefer to change to another formula? Uh, Dr. Aida? Um, if the patient is uh, suffering from, or for example, the GI side effect like constipation, um, I would, number one, ask how is she taking the medication? Because we, we talk about the low dose, isn't it, just now? Uh, yes. It's like, how high is the dosage? Um, uh, is it just a constipation an issue? Is there anything else? Um, you know, is she vomiting or anything like that? If she has, uh, and how... Uh, bothered is she by the constipation um, uh, number one if she doesn't have any uh, side effects uh, apart from constipation uh, it's worth considering adding um, you know some sto uh, stool softener that's one uh, you try not to change the medication uh, that is one option the other option is if she's taking uh, the medication daily and is uh, as we discussed earlier is a higher elemental iron dosage then you might want to consider alternate day the EOD uh, dosing. Yes, EOD or twice or three times um, per week. Sort of like uh, dosing per week. Uh, that is something to consider. Uh, but you have to uh, 
be aware sometimes uh, for our uh, obstetrician especially when you uh, when you're dealing with limited number of weeks you know before the patient deliver uh, sometimes uh, trying to maintain on the same medication but trying to sort of like um, move around you know sort of like ways to take it and things like that might not be suitable so in that case we might want to change her to a different tablets and things like that so it depends on the whole uh, individual situation really but if the patient can tolerate it she can swallow it and she doesn't have like vomiting symptoms and things like that then maybe worth considering AOD first and then if she still struggle, then change, um, I think, to different formulation. Okay, so basically we need to see how patient has yeah, any other symptoms. Yeah, how bad it is. Yeah. How bad is the side effect? Yeah, sometimes she can say, oh, I can still take it every day, uh, but it's just a constipation that bothers her. Then maybe worth adding something, you know, to relieve the constipation. But if mm. she thinks that, oh, it makes my life miserable, then you might want to uh, change into a different formulation. Yeah, I think because of our Asian perspective, well, we, mm. we, keep, we tend to have a mindset that we need to go toilet like every day. Yes. If not, it's not normal. But actually, it's not the case, right? Uh, yeah, especially in pregnancy, because of the hormonal change and because of progesterone and things like that, um, they don't, sometimes they might notice that there's a, you know, change in the bowel habit anyway. So they might not go to toilet every day because of the pregnancy itself. Um, mm. But yeah, it's something worth considering. Okay. Okay. So the next question, maybe I direct to Prof. Daleha. So in your practice, how, this question is like, how long can we put patient on iron? Maybe I would say, I would rephrase it as like, maybe if patient get unchecked, like what's the longest period that you will ask the customer to come back? Okay, right. Um, interesting question. Uh, well, I would say that um, it, it all depends on how long it is needed by the patient. For example, uh, a patient who is pregnant, would need iron throughout the pregnancy in general, in most cases, right? Uh, the only exception is probably people who are really very well nourished, like those in industrialized countries and all that, you know, uh, where the uh, average serum ferritin in the whole population is already so high, you don't even need uh, iron supplementation or maybe very minimal iron supplementation. Uh, but um, uh, generally, patients uh, in pregnancy uh, particularly in our country, definitely will need iron supplementation at least a low dose throughout the pregnancy. Uh, for those with uh, ongoing uh, uh, chronic blood loss, for example, those with menorrhagia, all right, as long as the problem has not resolved, then uh, it would be advisable to put them on oral iron as long as the problem persists. Yes. Yeah, so that, that's the, the general principle. Okay, so there's another question here because we just want to talk more about the pregnant, right? So how about those as adolescent age? Like they have like, and if they are anemic, maybe probably due to hormone changes or they are like having menstrual bleed, uh, high menstrual bleeding, right? So what are the usually uh, suggestion to manage this type of customer on the iron therapy? Right. Um, those who are uh, adolescents, very often their um, anemia or iron deficiency is because of men's, uh, excessive menstrual blood loss, uh, in which case it is advisable to put them on a long-term uh, iron supplementation. Um, however, do be cautious about the possibility of some of them actually having uh, hemoglobinopathies like uh, thalassemia, HBE trait, and things like that. So um, you need to have, uh, you know, uh, take a good uh, family history and see whether there's any family history of hemoglobinopathy. Sometimes a simple check on the uh, hemogram, like the MCV, MCH, will tell you that there is a high possibility that uh, she is actually, um, you know, uh, having uh, thalassemia, for example. Um, if the MCV is less than 75, MCH is less than 25, very likely you are actually dealing with somebody with uh, hemoglo hemoglobinopathy rather than iron deficiency. All right. And in cases of hemoglobinopathy, quite a number of them may actually have excess iron uh, because iron is not lost from the body in the hemolytic process. I see. Yeah. Mm. So I think it's very key, very important also we do the complete full blood count, then we see each of them, right? Rather yeah. than just a HB test, better to do in a lab for that. 
Correct. So with, okay, so the next question will be for Dr. Aida. Mm-hmm. So with low dosing, right, how fast we can expect the HB level to rise after giving oral iron? I think also mentioned in your slide, maybe we yes. need to emphasize it again. Yes. Uh, so from uh, the sign-on study, um, bearing in mind this is the when they look at both mild and moderate anemia, um, after two weeks, they uh, they found a um a average increment of one gram after a couple of weeks, but they found that the increment is highest. Uh, so but if they split moderate and uh mild, the moderate actually increased about one point five gram. So it depends on how bad the anemia is. If they have moderate anemia, you expect um um you can expect. I would say after two weeks, uh, more than a gram increment. So, uh, it depends which how bad is the anemia. So, if it's mild, maybe you expect half a gram, not 0.5. Uh, perhaps uh, for more severe one, you can expect increment uh, up to like one gram over two weeks. Okay. Thank you, um, yeah, can I just mention one thing? When we are dealing with uh, moderate anemia or uh, a more severe type of anemia, uh, it's very, very important that we advise patients uh, that they get some sort of follow-up on their hemoglobin level because, you know, sometimes you give them a certain treatment, they are tolerating the treatment, but the HP is not coming up. Then you have to start thinking about other... Why not? Yes, not? yes. And the yeah. increment, uh, maybe about one gram over two weeks uh, but if you want to repeat I wouldn't repeat it after two weeks maybe give it a month a good month and then repeat it after that yeah very important for us to see the progress because yes. if we don't we don't pantau or it's very hard to yeah. see whether it's suitable or not and don't leave it until three months I think uh, for the severe ones or at least uh, pregnant ones I you know as a general rule we, we check it at least three to four weeks uh, because we want to rapid, so sort of like we want to monitor it very closely. Yeah. So for pregnant women, we rec- so doctor will be recommending like one month follow up lah. The late, the uh, longest yes. is one month. Yeah. It depends how bad it is, but on average, you want to repeat it after four weeks. Yeah. Okay. So doctor uh, and prof, right, in your practice, right? How do you advise patient to incorporate diet sources? Like just now, I also presented on the foods, right? So what's your usually usual practice on this? Okay, um, dietary um, intake of iron is certainly very important. Um, I remember um, if I could just uh, cite one case study. Um, I remember there was one postpartum woman uh, uh, many years ago who, who I was treating. Um, she delivered with me and then after delivery, she had, um, unfortunately, she had uh, uh, excessive bleeding and her hemoglobin dropped to um, uh, 6 gram percent. Okay, and uh, uh, despite our recommendation to have some blood transfusion before she goes home, she was adamant that she doesn't want uh, to have uh, blood transfusion because of her fear of the side effects of uh, transfusion and the long-term complications. So um, she promised me that she would take a very good diet. So I told her to take a lot of um, um, high iron-containing diet, like for example, uh, liver, uh, broccoli, um, uh, uh, cockles, you know, that sort of thing. And um, I, I gave her IV iron uh, to start with and then uh, top her up with uh, oral iron as well plus her dietary um, uh, intake. Six weeks later when I saw her, the hemoglobin is already back to normal. Oh, yeah. it should be quite, considered quite fast. That's right, yes. So uh, that's the thing. Um, uh but the other thing that is also important in terms of dietary intake is um, to avoid um, elements that can inhibit iron um, uh, absorption, like what you mentioned in your yeah. uh, lecture just now, that is very important. Uh, and uh, if you advise that to the patient, that will also um, uh, enhance their um, uh, iron absorption and uh, return of the hemoglobin back to normal with uh, not very much um, other measures. You don't have to, to give you know, uh, uh, blood transfusion and things like that mm. and uh, or even IV iron, not very much. I only gave her uh, half the dose that she required for the IV because she couldn't come back you know, so many times for the yeah. IV iron. You know, just one sitting maximum dose uh, of Vinofer 
and then um, subsequently it was just her oral iron and uh, dietary intake. Mm. Okay, thank you, doctor. I think the next question maybe uh so so far for me I haven't seen any yet. Do you have seen any allergic issue previously for the iron therapy? Um, allergy to uh. Oral iron, I have not seen yet, although there has been, uh, well, in the literature, you can see some reports, but I have never seen one myself. Um, IV iron, again, um, Cosmofer is supposed to be more allergic uh, prone to, compared to uh, Vinofer. Vinofer, almost no allergy. Uh, but I have not seen any allergy in front of my eyes or anaphylactic shock, whatever, from these two uh, IV iron um, supplementation, uh, I mean, IV iron therapy. Uh, but I've seen one... Uh, who had uh, IV iron toxicity uh, from Binofer. Um, mm -hmm. If you have, if your you, if your nurse, for example, that's why it's very important. The rate of uh, uh, infusion of the IV iron is very important. If you go beyond a certain rate, the patient can develop symptoms of toxicity. I remember this was a young girl who developed sudden episode of abdominal pain, and when we checked. Uh, the nurse actually run the um, IV iron a little bit faster because um, uh, she forgot to monitor it and it was actually not running as it should have been. And I the see. patient was like, you know, um, I think going to be discharged uh, in a couple of hours. So she was trying to finish it up very quickly before the patient goes off. So, you know, she, she ran it fast and that caused the patient to have abdominal pain. So we stopped it. But uh, fortunately, it reversed itself very quickly. Okay, uh, so this I think this question is also quite relevant for our practice. Let's say a customer just get an IV injection in the hospital and they come out to not ask them to buy outside the iron. So how long we can start the oral iron tablet? Should we wait for some time or we can just start immediately after the IV iron? Actually, yes, you can start immediately. IV iron and oral iron, different uh, mechanisms of getting into the body, one directly into the uh, intravenous uh, circulation. The other one is uh, through absorption through the uh, gastrointestinal tract. So there is no um, contraindication of, of one to the other. They can happen concurrently. You can give the oral iron to, um, immediately after you have completed the uh, IV iron infusion. So it's just to give as fast as we can. Uh. Yep. Okay. So uh I think some of them uh, some of the time I think Dr. or Prof also seen patient with let's say the patient they need iron supplementation and they also prescribe for calcium carbonate at the same time, like for preeclampsia prophylaxis, right? So what are your usual counseling points for this group of uh, patients? Okay, specifically in relation uh, with regard to uh, iron uh, versus calcium, both are divalent cations. That means, you know, iron is also Fe2+, plus and uh, mm -hmm. calcium is calcium 2+. plus. Yes. So uh, they are said to compete with each other for absorption into the body. So uh, because of that, I usually um, advise my patient, and this is what is recorded elsewhere as well, uh, that uh, they are supposed to take it at different times of the day. If they take the uh, oral iron in the morning, then the calcium should be taken at night or vice versa. At least a few hours, uh, you know, apart from each other. We know the gastric emptying time takes at least two to three hours. So that's the minimum gap between the two. Lah. Yeah, I also agree. We usually get two to four hours. Lah. Or morning and night, like, it's easier for the customer to take actually. So, uh, Dr. Aida, have you any noticed any trends or pattern in specific population they are more susceptible to iron deficiency based on experience? Uh, based on experience, obviously I'm obstetrician and gynecologist. <laughs> so, the ones that we come across is uh, women of reproductive age, meaning the, the, the ones with, uh, you know, who's menstruating and also uh, uh, pregnant women. Um, the thing that you have to to the ones that we come across quite a lot is um the patient menstruating women um when they have iron deficiency anemia normally they can tolerate a very low level as uh, prof zalia mentioned one of the patient uh, that it can go really low before they become symptomatic so sometimes when you speak to patient you might miss ones with um they might not present with uh, symptoms of iron deficiency 
um, until it's really low. Uh, I've come across patient who is um, HB4, sometimes 5, and uh, and they, they only just become symptomatic. So basically, they can drop over a long period of time because mm. the menstruation loss is over month. You know, over um, a long period of time, they get used to the symptoms. So sometimes you can say, oh, are you, are you uh, breathless and things like that? They don't. Uh, they don't no, notice no it. feeling yes um so that's the ones that you come across and uh, a lot of young women actually young i mean less than 30 years old they come and uh, they come to hospital because of symptoms and and when you check the hp is you know it can be as low as four and five so those patients will require obviously blood transfusion and then we then top up with um uh, oral iron supplement but one thing that I would like to emphasize is um, there must be a reason why somebody's anemic. So when you're just topping up the iron, um, we still need to address the underlying issue. So it's not just, oh, top up iron and go away. So this patient will need uh, some sort of investigation because obviously, you know, four and five HB is not, is not, <laughs> not normal. normal. And some, yeah. uh, one of the patient actually was started on uh, iron and then was just sent away without any gynae referral and that went on for a good two to three years. Um, so yeah, so just something to be aware of. Yeah, we need to have like we can we cannot like look down on this disease. Uh. it's yes. actually very common, right? Yes, and you have to if if it is really low or even if it's like uh you know if it's uh below ten, mm. I would normally say please go and get it checked or at least get somebody to follow her up medically. Yeah. So in in normal condition for those like teenagers, right? Suddenly mm -hmm. let's say they suddenly have any heavy menstrual bleeding, mm -hmm. but due to unknown cause. So it's all right to give the oral iron for a short period of time. Um. Yes. Uh. But uh. As uh. Prof. Zala did mention earlier. Um. Yes, we can give oral iron, but again, the underlying, the underlying yeah, problem the underlying. needs to be addressed. I mean, she can take oral iron, but maybe with an advice. You know, if your menstruation is still heavy, uh, please see a doctor because what we're doing is just uh treating the iron deficiency we're not treating the underlying cause feeding, yeah. yes sometimes it resolves on its own but she just needs somebody to follow her up really mm -hmm. yeah yeah so i think this is another good question also because i think many people they they like they prefer or they like to do blood donation mm -hmm. i mean we have customer like this right but sometimes their hb is not nice yeah kurang sedikit tak boleh nak donate so what's what's your uh recommendation of this group customer or like can I just take some iron tablet to boost up a bit so that I can do the donation? Or is it safe to do so? Or how long they should take so that I can do the, these good things for the community? Uh, okay. Uh, Prof. Zah might have a different yeah. answer. Can, can, yeah, Prof. Zah might uh, want to answer this. That, that's very interesting for me. Yeah. Um, well, it is also tied to other things, other causes of uh, anemia like thalassemia and all that. You know, what is important is what is the cause of your uh, low hemoglobin? All right. If it is just simple iron deficiency anemia, okay, you might as well treat yourself first, you know, get your hemoglobin boosted up and then you can uh, uh, donate how much you want. All right. But there are uh, people who have um, uh, a need, who are suffering from anemia because of uh, hemoglobinopathy. Um, in such cases, your blood actually tak laku. You know, the blood bank will not want it anyway. <laughs> because because the, is no good. <laughs> yeah, because the lifespan of your RBCs is much shorter than the average person. You mm -hmm. know, the average person's hemoglobin may uh the, the red blood cells will last 120 days, yours will last um at the most max maybe 90 days or even shorter than that. So is it, it is not really worth donating your blood in such circumstances. So very important. Find out why that happens, why your hemoglobin is low, and do the necessary things. But let's say if the the the, the person there she don't know the HB level. Right. Uh, if you do not know the your HB level, I do not think it is that advisable for you to donate your blood because you yourself may be actually uh suffering from anemia, and uh, um well 
you know, the same thing goes in terms of um, like, you know, if you are in an aeroplane um, and that uh, safety uh, uh, precautions, um, uh, what do you call that, briefing by the uh, stewardess, they usually say, you know, when, when in, terms, in times of emergency, treat yourself first before you treat the person next to you, right? Even if it is a <laughs> So same thing, you know, if you have anemia, you know, it's better for you to take care of yourself first, correct that before you uh, try to correct other people. Okay, very important. And also because if your hemoglobin is already compromised, um, your blood may not be as uh, useful as somebody with a good hemoglobin level. Yeah. Okay, I think it makes sense. Yeah, yeah, can yeah. I just just uh, add a little uh, bit to that? Yeah, sure, um, especially for male um, blood donor, um, because you uh, normally male, uh, not patient lah, but blood donor, they don't have reason to look, you know, to become IDA. Not not many reason because they're not menstruating and things like that. So mm -hmm. if they are they are anemic to start off with, then they better get it checked. Um, for because sometimes like for females, sometimes they say, oh yeah, because they lose blood every month and things like that. Especially male blood donor, uh, as um, if before you you had normal hemoglobin and suddenly you want to give blood and you are anemic, uh, my suggestion is get it checked and find the cause of anemia. Yeah. Yeah. Before you start giving blood. Okay. So there actually there are still many questions in the chat box. I think I will choose the last question for today. So uh, according to the presentation just now, right? So doctor actually suggests to use ferrous gluconate actually has a lower element of iron compared to other ferrous salt, right? We have a higher percentage. Is it the aim is to achieve the optimal absorption from low dose, right? Uh, yes. Um, okay. The uh, When we talk about uh, iron dosage, we, we go by uh, elemental whatever dose of elemental iron that that particular preparation offer. Um, yeah, so uh, it just happened that the one used in Sinon study, it's a ferrous gluconate, but the, the oral elemental iron per tablet is 30 milligram. Um, so the if you are to maximize the absorption, then uh, you want to go with lower dosage, you know, based on uh, recent evidence, anything below 40. So that means if you want to go uh, for daily uh, supplement, then worth taking one tablet uh, that contains 30 milligram. Um, having said that, if you have any other preparation that provide similar dose of elemental iron, then there's no reason not to use that one. But it's just happened that we're talking about Sinon study. Yeah, because I think the fractional absorption is something that we look at. Even the lowest high... Yeah. High elemental iron doesn't mean anything because we need to look at the elemental iron content only. Yes, if you if you read paper, I just I just want to mention if you read paper, they're talking about fractional absorption. That means what is the percentage of iron being absorbed? But if you want to look at the total iron absorption, obviously if you give the higher dose over long period of time, you may get higher total absorption in a long run. However, that might be uh, at the expense of patient compliance, side effects, and things like that. So when you read the studies or papers, they will talk about fractional absorption. So meaning how much of that tablet, you know, uh, dosage that being absorbed. It's, they're not talking about total iron absorption. Uh, but yeah, but um, it's worth considering uh, low dosage because obviously, you know, from the evidence that it's equally effective in increasing HP anyway. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Prof. Dr. Zaleha and also Dr. Aida for joining our session today. I think they've learned a lot from your lecture just now and also the panel discussion just now. Swipe or X.